This is the art of start-up war. And my name is Brian McMahon, your host and sensei. Here is what we know. 98% of startups will fail every single day. And mostly due to reasons outside your control. The Expert Dojo Startup Accelerator, we look to even up the playing field by sitting down with the greatest minds in startup investment right here in our studio in Silicon Beach, where we look to shine a light on your path to success. Now, our guests each week have invested millions of dollars into startups and are the most respected investors in the world. Now, they share all they know with you, the listener. So join us on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, starting off your week, winning the war, making start up failure. So welcome back. It's another week. It's another podcast. You're here with Brian from Expert Dojo. Yet again, I am talking to another phenomenal, well-respected angel in this community. I should say long-standing angel in this early stage community. Maybe you're like, don't say that, Brian. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Makes me sound like a senior citizen. <laughs> You've been around for a long time. Listen, you've been supporting been. the early stage startup community for how long? 30 12 years? years? 12 <laughs> years. Yeah, long time. And and actually, even before that, even back before we got started, you know, back when I was, God, back in the 80s, starting my, my very first company. So welcome, Doug. Oh, a new friend. You. A thank new you. friend to the dojo and a new friend to me. We met over at the Canadian Consulate General, which was very... Nice dinner, yep. I have to say. Yeah, yep. um, repressed Catholic Irish fellow doesn't get fed that well that often. But that particular <laughs> evening, there was some nice fish being fried. Well, we had a sharp entrepreneur sitting between us. We did, yeah, Canada. yeah. She was awesome. Um, I, I, but I was, it was just really inspiring. We had a few minutes to talk back over there, and I could really feel in the moment that it wasn't just a question of you saying, yeah, I like investing in startups, and obviously Archangels, which is your angel group, I want to talk about as well. It was deeper than that. It was that you are so immersely ingrained in the early stage startup community. It's great. And then you came around here, you supported our startups. And as an angel, you came and you came to our demo day. You met them, you spoke to them, you listened to them. So you're awesome in my book. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Doug. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's an addiction. I got to tell you that. It's uh, a good addiction, right? It's a good addiction. Yeah. I, yeah, there's that old phrase about our ent- entrepreneurs. Are they really made or are they just born that way? And I really think they're kind of born that way. Uh, it was just even myself. I can still remember doing a job interview way back in the early 80s. And this guy in the middle of the interview stopped about five minutes in. He says, I'm going to tell you something I've never said to anybody else. I go, what's that? He goes, first of all, we're not going to hire you. But second of all, you should go start your own company. I said, I've never interviewed anybody that just exhibits the traits that says this man needs to start his own business. That's nice. And it's stayed in my head ever since. So way back in 1986, I took that walk, took that leap of faith. And what happened? Well, <clears throat> I was coming back from a vacation in the Bahamas. I had a new Prince graphite racket, $300 back then. I and had one of those. Remember when they first came out? Yeah, they were beautiful. for sure. Are you kidding me? And they had a little flimsy zip case on the top, and they had it in the overhead bin on the airplane. And a guy threw a briefcase up there and broke my racket in the strings. Nice. And I'm like, there's got to be something better. So I came back on an architecture. Uh, to work with, and we designed this carrying case, hard plastic carrying case for tennis rackets. I got W.R. Grace involved in designing it for me and doing the handles. Got patents in six countries on it. It was my first taste of entrepreneurship, and I loved every minute of it. It's tough, though, because you moved directly into the space of intellectual property, oh, yeah. design, and where you build it, how you build it, how you keep your cost down. Oh, it's no, not a simple I, world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is manufacturing 101. And to tell you, I had any knowledge in that space, I really didn't. My background really was in finance and technology. Yeah. So I was doing a consumer product, and I had no idea about consumer products. So what products. happened? Well, we got a couple of samples made, and I remember standing over at a, at a tennis club where I lived down in Newport Beach, and I had it on a fold-out cardboard table and had the case sitting there. Uh-huh. And it was pe- this talk about just basic market research, right? And as people walk by... I'd say, how much would you pay for a carrying case? At two- By the way, I love that. You know, That's the only market validation there is. I think so. Like, I, how I, much money are you going to give for this? Well, that. And that's actually what I did. And here's a case, two carrying, you know, 
You can put two rackets in here, two cans of balls, place for your sweatbands. And people would tell me, well, I'd pay 60 bucks or I'd pay 50 bucks, which was very dismal because it cost me 25 to make it. I thought I'd sell it to the stores for 50. They in turn would sell it for 100. So I turned out that I didn't have a market, but God bless the guys at WR Grace. They liked it. They bought the uh, they bought everything, so I got all my money back, plus a little bit. God, nice. So I went into my second crazy venture. What did they do? Did they then <clears throat> launch it afterwards, or they just stored it? No, I think you've seen it in a different form. Right. Uh, I mean, it was a hard plastic case. Have you seen the plastic case for golf clubs? I have. And actually, you know, even on tennis rackets. That came after us. That came oh, after us. Oh, so they moved it into. But even in tennis yeah. rackets, I was going to say, if you look at the cases now, they're 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 still kind of sexy and nice. But they do. You there's a hard cover underneath. You that. had to. You Too expensive. Through. You could break them. So uh, anyway, the next venture after that was, you know, right place, right time is so important. You know, Brian, it's that um, communism was coming to a close in Poland. I was engaged at that time to a girl whose family came from Poland. Uh, he had made a fortune doing a bunch of other things. And so, you know, drop away fuel tanks, uh, refrigerator injection moldings, things like that for Kenmore. So we were saying, what could we ship over to, to Poland? This yeah. is actually sitting around the dinner table one night. We hear these crazy stories. And it was his daughter who said, Dad, they really want blue jeans over there. I went, blue jeans? You're right. I heard about that. So the next thing you know, we go to a store, went back to, to a Gap store and bought a bunch of blue jeans, shipped them over to Poland. Again, not knowing what we're doing, we hired some college girls to stand on street corners and sell Levi blue jeans uh, to the public uh, for 10 times what we paid for them. We sold out our entire inventory in one hour, in one hour in Warsaw. So the next Get thing you know- Get the hell out of here. Yeah. So the next thing you know, we literally went back to the same Gap store and bought all of the inventory at Gap. That took three days, by the way, because nobody was going to sell us the jeans at full retail, nor did they quite understand it all. So uh, I had to get approval from corporate. <laughs> it was all a bunch of fun things. So so there was no, the, again, in that case, there was no intellectual property. There was nothing that was going to keep it yours. You just saw an opportunity and you thought, I'm going to sell a stack of this as quickly as I possibly can and get it out to the market. That's it, exactly. I, I knew everybody loved blue jeans over in that part in Eastern Europe. How long did that party last for? Uh, a couple of months. We kept selling them all. The, and the only reason it came to an end was that, you know, we get a little goofy in our thinking. It, it, he was a good trainer, Stanley. Because here I am filling up containers with blue jeans, shipping yeah. them over. And one day he says, why is the container coming back empty? Well, it's huh. not ours, Stanley. It belongs to the shipping company. No, no. Why aren't we putting something in that container that we can sell here? Yeah. I went, oh, hadn't thought about that, Yeah. right? Out of the box. Next thing you know, I'm over in Warsaw, and I am looking at cut crystal, <clears throat> carved wooden boxes, um, sadly enough, stolen religious artifacts, Yeah. an awful lot of that. And then somebody came to me with vodka. I went, oh, yeah, Paul, and they're famous for vodka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I was talking to Stanley about it, I was back home. A fellow at church heard us, and he says, you know, South Africa – makes a great vodka. I said, yeah, but South Africa practices apartheid. We can't do business there. Yeah. He says, well, maybe you can. Now, next thing you know, I'm on a plane flying down to Harare, Zimbabwe to meet with a guy named George and the, uh, the distiller, well, the bottler, Snelling and Snelling. And uh, by the time we got done, it was like a Miami Vice, Miami Vice kind of thing. Ten-foot walls, guys with AK-47s and peacocks <laughs> roaming the yard, yeah. right, in Zimbabwe. And we struck a deal. They were going to buy the vodka. They'd put it together. They would arrive in Zimbabwe. We'd give a 5% markup. <clears throat> and on the first shipment, we then had to move it across the continent of Africa to Cairo and ship it out of Cairo. And that was a learning curve. I felt like Indiana Jones. I mean, we're in trucks, guys with weapons, Going across the countryside, river boats. At one point, we're on the back of camels. I mean, it was quite an adventure ship. So, it? look, while well, you grab a sip of coffee, I want to surmise this a little bit for all of our guests listening. And all of our guests listening, by the way, are entrepreneurs. If you're not an entrepreneur, you're probably lost on this podcast, right? So, 
here's what we're looking at. Like I hear so many people saying, oh, I wish I had a great idea. I wish I had an opportunity to be able to get the next big thing. Oh, those guys are so fortunate that they managed to be part of that. No, that's not the case. These ideas surround us all day, every day. These opportunities are here every second of the day. Most people choose to ignore them because we're too busy watching whatever latest series has come up on Netflix. We're too busy going to the bar to meet with friends. And I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy our lives. I'm just saying that generally uh, luck favours the bold. And, And when you go and say, I am going to find the best possible opportunity, then that is what exactly what you're going to find as long as you open your eyes properly, right? Well, I'm going to agree with you 100%. Entrepreneurs are wired differently than anybody else because they see the universe in a very different way, okay? We just had to see it as an opportunity, okay? And, and we took advantage of that opportunity. And that harkens back to entrepreneurs are really brave souls because they risk everything. They risk their reputation, their fortunes, their family's fortunes. They put it all on the line. God, I love these. Why guys. am I smiling when you say this? <laughs> like, it's not. Is there something wrong with us psychologically <laughs> that, like, some, you're saying the most awful, terrible thing that could possibly happen to a person in the world? It's like a country and western song, and I'm thinking, isn't that awesome? And yeah. It's not. But that's that's. It's a burn you get. All of a sudden, I'll just tell people this: that, that you get a point in your life where. You can't work for somebody anymore. Right. They just something changes in you. you I wouldn't you, hire me. Yeah, I wouldn't hire me. Why? Because I've been in those big corporations. I was with the third largest computer company in the world at the time. And they just didn't want to hear innovation. They didn't want to hear unless it came out of an R&D department where they spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. They, they're too slow to turn around. Entrepreneurs, we can see an opportunity and because it's just us. I don't have to go through a committee. I don't have to worry about budgets, okay? We just move, and we move quickly. Okay? And I, I can give you story after story of folks that I've we seen do. have taken advantage I, of this. I like your Doug Health warning earlier on today where you said, just before we started the podcast, with everything we're talking about right now, the one area you got to be real careful is taking money from your family because one thing no, I wouldn't do it. is risking it all on your own, Another yep. thing is bringing your family's money and the emotions that come with that money in with it, right? Let me give you a real story. I mean, my dad's a U.S. Air Force officer, right? We're middle class. You know, we're not big money at all. So when my dad gave me 50 grand to invest in, in Savannah Vodka, which is the vodka I was importing, uh, I lost it all. And that makes for a really uncomfortable family Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, when they're sitting across the table and, you know, it took your dad 10 years to save up that. And there's no turkey, but there's a lot of bottles of vodka around the table. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Get Dave, that was the bright side. I used to get to drink my losses. (laughs) But I tell people this. I do it all the time. I've lectured at Butler, Purdue, Fullerton, UCI, you name it. I've, I've been to a variety of schools. And I just tell you, don't take money from your family. You know, and only take it from the friends you're willing to lose. Yeah. Okay, because... I've been there personally, and it's just not a good feeling. Um, take it from, you know, angels, it's better. Uh, be willing to work with angels. Be, you know, the phrase we use is coachable. Right. Take our advice. We've already done this walk. We've been there with you. Yeah. We know what it's like. We share it. We're, you know, band of brothers in the sense that we've already been in the foxholes with you. We've taken the arrows. We've taken the shots. We, we've made all the bad mistakes. And... We're trying to help you as an investor, try and help you to avoid those pitfalls yeah. that don't put you out of business. Do they listen? I don't know. The Angel Capital Association says the failure rate on startups runs about 92%. Right. And the three big reasons, management problems, lack of money, or no market. And sometimes, and I, I have actually, the nation That's of Canada. That's interesting. They're the three reasons, right? Yeah, There's a yeah. lack of market. Yeah. Management. Well, some... we don't realize that the hardest thing I've seen this. I've actually trained and spoken in front of a large number of entrepreneurs on this, is that we get myopic. We think the world is going to love the widget we just built. Yeah. Okay. But did you stand out in front of the tennis courts with your product right there? No. And have people tell you, yay or nay? Mm. Most of us don't. No. And by the time we get the nays, we've already burned our way through a million, two million, three million. And you got to face your friends and family and say, I just lost all your money. I'm really sorry. 
But by the way, I've got another really cool idea. Yeah, it's just really hard. Yeah, it's really and hard. so that's what makes entrepreneurs very, very special people. I love that. And you've already segued directly into the first question that I normally ask, which is what real strong, I don't want to say disaster or train wreck, but what bad thing happened that you got a really good lesson from? And and I love that. I think the, the borrowing money from family is just a great lesson for everybody here. And by the way, if you have a family who are ridiculously wealthy and they have $50,000 or $25,000 to a side that they were going to spend going to the holiday parks this summer, okay. But we're talking about normal people like us yeah. where actual money matters. And if the money matters and it could be spent on something more important, then work your ass off finding angels and people in the community who find this a good business idea right. rather than anything else. I actually had one of the first people People who came through the dojo, uh, he, he wanted to build an Italian restaurant uh, because his, his uncle told him he made really good meatballs. And he <laughs> sat down and we were there with his mom and everything. I asked him all these questions about how are you going to run the business? What's the logistics of the business? The guy had done nothing ever in business before. had never run a business, never run a restaurant. And I said to him, hey, do you mind if I say something to your mom, which is directly about my opinion on whether she should lend you money? And he's going, yeah, knock yourself out. And I said to her, if you truly love your son, you will not give him one dime for this business. Yeah. And I don't say it to be mean to you. I actually have given you the greatest gift, which is my truth. It doesn't mean that I'm right. You may have been the greatest entrepreneur ever, but the probability is against you having a relationship with your mother in three or four months' time. Well, take some of the big names. Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, uh, and go on and on, right? Did any of these guys take a dime for their families? No, No, they really didn't. No. Okay, they went straight out, went right for the VCs. Steve Jobs, classic story, camped himself out in front of a VC's office, you know, and beg, 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 beg until the guy finally said, I'll give you some money so you'll go away. And that is a point, by the way. So we find that with our entrepreneurs, we should expect them to pitch no less than 150 to 170 times well, to get the angels or VC they want. I mean, you can get lucky, you know, right? No, no, but... no. It's mathematics. It's mm. just simple mathematics. First of all, what is the average check size written by an angel in the U.S.? Now, unfortunately, and again, I'll quote the Kauffman Foundation, they don't give you a real number. They say between 25 and 35. Let's just throw out the 35 because I personally never see that. Mm. You see the 25. So if you're trying to raise $1 million on a a venture and 25 is the average angel check, you need to get 40 of those. Right. Okay? That means you got to talk to 40 people. And to find 40 people to say yes probably means you're going to have to talk to 100 people. And the rest. And the rest. You're going to get no, 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 no. And that's actually what I love about entrepreneurs. No's don't slow us down. It's like, okay, good. You're out of my way. Next and you go right to the next person. So then you raise your, your million. But I'll say this to him, blue in the face. You are always, 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 did I say that enough times? Always looking for money until your positive cash flow for one year. Okay? It's the most humbling experience you can possibly go through. You get really tired of asking for money. You don't quite understand why nobody understands your dreams. Oh, and be really careful who you take that check from. Mm. Okay? Um Again, somebody what's, the downs- about. what's the downside with <clears throat> the wrong people? Well, real quick, is there's three kinds of investors. There's the kind that says, here's my check. Give me a jingle. Bring me update it. Maybe quarter. Give me an update. Those guys lose their money every single time. Right. I've seen that my whole life. Mm. Uh, the other is, and this is one that's really dangerous. Here's my check. Where's my desk? You want to be really careful who you let in to your, your establishment. Because it might be you're turning the fox loose in the chicken coop. Okay. You may bring in somebody because they've got a great check, but then they become a disrupting influence in the organization. They could be they're there because they like your ideal. Maybe they want to move you out. This is your mother-in-law, isn't it? Yeah. You want her to take care of the kids on Sunday, but you don't want her moving in. That's it. That's it. Same thing. And then the last is the best one. Here's my check. Let me look at my 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 card index file, my eye contacts, and let me get back to you and give you some names of people you can call, yeah. uh, things that can I help move you along. And, and those, I'll strategize with you when you need strategy meetings. That's right. And, and they'll things, probably yeah. say, give me a jingle maybe once a week or, you know, let's talk. Let's stay in touch. What do you need? How can I help? I've given you money, but money's not the end-all, be-all thing. Sometimes you need experience. Yeah. Hey, do you know anybody that's in uh, – you know, a good uh, developer. 
you know, maybe they know, I don't know what language, C++ or something. Mm. I need one of those guys. You say, yeah, matter of fact, I do. Or you're trying to get into a market. Hey, do you know a guy named Brian? He's got something called Expert Dojo. Maybe you want to talk with him, right? So it's way more sometimes than the money. You know, decades ago, Peter Drucker called them knowledge workers. Okay, you find the guys with the, you know, with the, with the Rolex in their heads and experience in their heads you know, or in their past that you can apply to whatever your problems are currently. And trust me, you're not alone. There are a dozen people. There's a billion books written on everything. But it's really great when you've got somebody like, like yourself, right, that you can go and talk to and get a little bit of personal guidance. Yeah. And you can tweak the engine a little bit, move it this way. Nah, you know what? Don't waste your time going after that market. I've been in that market. It doesn't pay very well. You ought to look at this market, okay, yeah. and redirect you in the right directions, okay, or gently move you over there. I like um, that. I could talk forever on that one. And then, and then tell me how you went, you, you began, obviously, with your own businesses. You then moved into becoming an angel. Tell me where Archangels came from. It's well, a good it's my, name, it, by it, the way. Yeah, I, I want to have, <laughs> I, I want to be, be able to go home to my little guy and say, yeah, I just was over at my place at Archangels again today. It's what I do, you know. <laughs> well, the joke's always been that even heaven has a bureaucracy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, even heaven so, needs a majority vote there if, you go. if investment's right. going to be approved. So um, um, the funny thing is, you know, I've been kind of blessed. It was not my ideal. Um, when I formed Private Capital Network, that was not my ideal. That was 30 of my friends saying, Doug, we really don't like the group we're with. And uh, there were some issues there. Said, but we know you're a man of ethics and integrity. If you'll start a group, we'll join. And so I had 30 people in my very first get together. Uh, that group's been running for over 12 years. Um, two years into it, I got approached by two family offices. And at that time, I didn't even know what a family office was. Okay, these guys are like 25 million greater. These two guys both were 200 million plus. And they said, we like what you're doing here, but we've got different needs, different problems. Okay, could you put a group together for guys like us? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm one of the ordinary millionaires <laughs> that you talk about. And they said, no, but you, you've got names, contacts. So our year, for a whole year, we didn't even look at a company. We just, there was five of us, we met once a month, and we just talk. What are you working on? You know, Obama's getting elected. What do you think the place, you know, place to be for investing your money now? What are you in? Hey, guys, I need a new wealth manager. Anybody recommend somebody? Yeah. Okay. And we'd bring in speakers to talk to us, right? And uh, uh, as we evolved about our second year, and, and that group is about almost 11 years old now, um, we started inviting a single company in. And having been at the other end of this where I would stand in front of people and you have 10 minutes to pitch or 15 minutes to pitch. I just didn't like that model. Right. Okay. I don't think it works particularly well. I'm with you. Okay. What happens and what we've discovered, and so this is real information, is that we would bring one company in and it would be more of a dialogue, not a monologue. Yeah. It would be a conversation guided by a presentation deck. Yeah. And so we would ask questions all the way through. It's much better. And you've seen by osmosis at Expert Dojo, we've arrived in the same place. Yeah. Like I last week, we didn't do any group pitches. Yeah. Uh, and I just think that works better. I mean, first of all, the problem is most guys forget the question they want to ha ask if they got to wait five, ten minutes, right? Unless you write it down. As opposed to, I'm going to ask it right now. Uh, does the model work? Well, real data. We looked at eight companies last year. We don't have one every month. We only bring in a few. We looked at eight. Of the eight, six of them got checks. Okay? <laughs> Do you know what it is on a national average for angels to invest in startups? <laughs> it's not six out of eight. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you. They, I can tell you in 2015, four out of 100 got checks, okay, from angel groups. Four yeah. companies out of 100. Yeah. The following year, it fell to two out of 100. Okay. I don't know what it is yet for 2017. Yeah. Uh, I should go look and find out. Hopefully it's upticked a little bit, but I don't think No, it's, it's hard. We, yeah. we, we have been moving further and further away 
from pre-seed. Yep. And and look, seed today is kind of serious A, right? I see, I hear $3 million being mentioned when people are talking about seed. We've seen angels move away because angels are afraid. Yeah. You know, it's not because they, like, they want to get a better return. It's just that they're afraid because it's so much riskier. Well, to be able statistics, to the right one. 92% of all startups fail in the first three years. Right. For the three reasons I've given already. Management gets into a fight. We've seen that even with established companies. Um, uh, we've even seen it in corporate America. I mean, you know, look at Steve Jobs and John Scully. Yeah. Which, it, by the way, John Scully apart. came in our room and pitched the company to us. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Some of our guys invested. It went out of business three years later. Uh, That's sad interesting. Stories. Uh, I can go on and on. I mean, you've had Harry Winston's, Pete's Coffee, you know, a whole variety of companies come in the room. We get Did you few... invest in Pete's Coffee? Um, no. Um, while I wanted to invest in the nine stores that were going to open, yeah, yay, you had to also take on three restaurants that were starting in New York. Uh, well, two in New York, one in New Jersey, without a named chef in a market they'd never been in, in an industry they've never been in, a real restaurant. And we're like, no, you don't know what you're doing. Did they do it? No. No, Good. Yeah, no. I was going to say. Well, I've never and heard most of my the group Pete's walked away on that. Most of us, unfortunately, a lot of us did go in on John Scully's deal, and. Uh, but I know yeah. everybody's everybody's going. Go on, Brian. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him. Like, what what is it? What do those six have that made them so special that they were worthy of the investment? Boy, you know what? That's a really good question. A lot of times, it's the management team. Okay, if you've got an A management team and a C product, that'll go further than a C management team and an A product. Wow. Because on the on the latter on the former, it's it gravity will kick in and drag them down. A good management team can get you to the get you across the goal line. So we look at management teams all the time. Remember what I said earlier about market? Is it really a market? Do does a company really understand the market they're going into? Does it really satisfy a need? And can you articulate your your solution that in such a way that we understand, that you understand what you're getting yourself into, okay? And quite frankly, every now and then, you just plain like the deal, okay? If you, Harvard did an interesting study. <clears throat> now, they, they think a, a deck should be 19 slides long. I think they're crazy. Uh, do you know how many slides were in Zuckerberg's deck, Facebook? 11, 10, 11? Nine. Nine, okay. Nine. Uh, I think it was Google had something like six. Yeah. And, I mean, more is not better. Yeah. Okay. My analogy, by the way, is that I agree because it's all it is. It's just a it's just a guide to start a conversation. That's right. It's it, a teaser. And what happens is it becomes the crutch. This is a, I want this to be a big takeaway for everyone today as well. These damn PowerPoint presentations are a friggin' curse because what happens is you end up competing with them. And while everybody's reading all of the multitude of text that you put up on the screen, then people are finding it really hard to hear the words that you're saying, unless you're saying the exact same words that are on the screen, in which case you look like a schmuck because all you're doing is you're showing people that you know how to read. So really get your deck. I think Airbnb's deck is a great deck as well. Good it's really simple, really easy. It's like nine or ten slides. And then it allows you to really get to the meat of the conversation. Yeah, I, I'll tell you right now, it's Guy Kawasaki. I'll give him a plug. He was out of Apple. He knows uh, his stuff. Yeah, he always talks about just put one word. Watch, go watch the old rollouts by Steve Jobs. He'll put one word on the screen. Beautiful. And then he'll talk about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, the worry, not the worry. Well, the worry that your audience should have is that they'll be talking to a room and all they're going to see is the top of the heads. When you see that, it means there's too much information in your deck, and they're reading the deck and not listening to you. And you know something? I had the privilege of doing a TEDx talk, very different to a TED talk. Um, it's like a little baby TED talk. But the lovely thing about TEDx is you're not allowed write really anything on your slides, and you're not allowed to have any any have any prompts or aids or things that will actually help you. You just have to say it as it is, and it is a great training for you to go really deep into the core of the why and the message yep. as opposed to anything else. So yep. I, I, I love that advice. I believe less, 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 less is a million times more. Have it so that they feel what you're actually doing to bring Bro, change passion. to the world. That your passion. Be, yeah. And, then know, just, we, and then anchor it with numbers, right? Yeah. Because you well, want to then... I'm going to say something that's going to sound really boring. Your, your, your audience is going to hate this. Write a business plan. I hate business plans. 
I don't ever read business plans, okay, unless I want to look at a particular section. Well, that's great, Doug. Then why the heck do you want me to write one? Because it forces you to learn the different segments of your business. So for an example, when I got to the segment on my business plan when I was doing Savannah Vodka and I wanted to look at competition, I went out and had to go out and look at everything from absolute. That was I was importing, you know, vodka at that time. Have to look at all these companies. Same when I built the first internet. Well, we ran at one time one of the very first internet home banking products. We we're second only to Digital Insight, so we had to go look at their stuff. What are they doing? What? How do we tweak it, and get all the feedbacks? Um, I'm going to say something a little rough. Don't ever fall in love with your own product. Okay, um, be able to make changes. If somebody walks in the room, I mean, we never want to hear that our kid looks ugly, right? Yeah. Okay. But if somebody walks in the room and says, your kid looks ugly, but if you change these things, it'll look better. Your product looks really ugly. <laughs> you could change it a little bit. If you could address this or add these features, it might be more appealing to the market or the target audience you're going after. But don't get lost in development, 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 development. Yeah. I've already saw a company just... Four months ago in our room. Really cool product. I'm not going to go into the details about it. But the mad scientist running it is lost in trying to make it perfect. He's already on version three. And he hasn't sold one product yet. Yeah, poor guy. It's it's very, like, oh, it's my God. Tough. Start selling it before you roll out the changes and the modifications because yeah. you'll go out of business. And it's also because <clears throat> most entrepreneurs are creatives. And that is a blessing, but it is also a curse. Oh, yes. Because a creative will continue to do that one thing which you are amazing at, which is create. So I, I always feel this kind of three, two or maybe three personalities that we all fit into as entrepreneurs. We're either creatives or we are business development. Or I'm going to put logistics in there as well because sometimes the logistics splits away from the creative, right? Mm -hmm. I am a pure business development guy. Like, I can have the door wide open here, everybody coming in, stealing everything. Could have left the furniture out while it's raining, but I will wake up first thing in the morning and I will think, how are we going to move forward today? What are we going to achieve? What are we going to sell for our cohort? What investors are we going to bring in? What what companies are we going to move forward? It would be my yeah. my 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 waking thought for the first two hours until I can get it out of my head. <laughs> now that is a curse and it's a blessing because it's a blessing because you know I'm going to bring the bacon home. Coachability. Right? I'm going to yeah. say right now. I, I I agree with everything you just said. We always look at coachability. I mean, important, I, right? You know, that, I mean, you, you know I've had you guys probably... that don't want to listen to what you have to say. Yeah. We just had a guy two months ago come in the room, and the whole room said, I think he's got something, but I'm not sure I could spend any time with this guy because mm. he was absolutely, I'm right, you're wrong. I said, Really? Yeah, we're the ones with the money. Yeah. Okay. So, how wrong are we? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that we don't understand where you're going, but recognize their times, recognize your own limitations. There are times when the mad scientist needs to be taken away as the CEO and stick over into R&D. doesn't mean I'm going to lose his shares or give him less of the company, but you want to bring in somebody that knows how to run a company, how to build it, how to take it to the next level. Why? Remember what I said earlier? Companies fail because of no market, no money, management. Okay. If you look, remember I talked earlier about the Harvard deck. Yeah. 19 slides. Take a wild guess at the number one slide, according to Harvard, Harvard Business School, the number one slide that angels investors look at the longest. God, I know you're going to say team, right? No. no. You're not going to say team. Okay, no. good. Okay, okay. Hold no. on, hold on, hold on. Team, by the way, team is number two. Team is number two? Yeah. Oof, right. So we have the problem. We have the solution. I'm not going to go for either of those two. We have the market size. Market size is going to be one of my top three. Uh, we have the team, which is obviously right up there at number two. We have the traction and where the company is going to, how much money that we're raising. Okay, I will go for market size. The deal. Number one thing angels look at the last is slide? the deal structure. How it is. No, the very first one. You're talking about the deal structure. Is it put together in such a way that it makes sense? Do they have a good understanding of valuations? And let me just tell you, I've seen three companies in 12 months, mm. three, that have been in my room that have put valuations. We're worth $140 million, uh, actually all $120 million, 
and I have revenues of a half a million dollars. What? Get out of here. We're not going to make that investment. <laughs> We're just not going to do it. Okay. And they look at me like, don't you get it? I said, first of all, or even better, the one was $150 million on no revenues. Yeah. Okay. The potential, like, is, the potential is endless. Yeah. So <laughs> number one slide they'll look at. Number two, the management team. Right. Number three, the market size. You're exactly right. The very last thing, according to Harvard, that angel investors look at, if I had a drum roll, I'd use it right oh, now. There is a drum roll. Yeah. <laughs> the actual solution. Right. How interesting. Oh, look at that. We've got some music just to kick us off for the day. Da-da, da-da. I don't know what that is. Really? Oh, my view. <laughs> we like to get some lullaby music. It's kind of a, it's an entrepreneur thing just to really kick everything into gear and just get a little bit of lullaby music so you can kind of get to sleep and you can think to yourself <laughs> the world will be a better place. But we're going to follow it up with some with some killer music that the world is not a better place, <laughs> actually. It's entrepreneurs. But no, this well, rolling back a little bit, isn't it amazing? It's the last yeah. thing that angels look at is the actual solution. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's so huge. they'll look at the deal, so it'll make sense, okay, from their standpoint. You know, they're getting more bang for their bucks. Remember, it's, it's a balancing routine. They want as much of your company for as little as possible. You want to give up as little of your company for as much as possible. Yeah. And somewhere in the middle is that happy point where you both agree you've reached the number. Because it makes sense. Because what the angel is really looking to see is, is this a reasonable partner in the future? Because if you're going to be unreasonable at the start, the probability is you're going to be unreasonable for the rest of the time as well. So I'm with you there as well. Are there any, uh, I would like to kind of finish the interview, maybe to focus on where you see the next 12 months going as far as the great opportunities for startups, both from a market perspective, but then also from an archangel's perspective and what you feel you should be investing in. Well, we love tech. We really do. I've, I've, we've looked at a couple of the biosciences areas. Uh, they take too long. Mm. I mean, 17, 17 years. Yeah. Uh, if the, if they ever clear, um, my joke is I'll it's be dead before. <laughs> yeah, I'll be dead before any of them pay off. Yeah. AI is hot right now. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. I'd like to say virtual reality, but I don't think so yet. People are afraid still in yeah. that space, right? We, yeah. we, we there's, see there's that too. a lot of people in there. It's like the old dot com era I went through. A lot of people running in there, but only a handful of them are going to come out with something. And and right now they still look a little too much like toys. Um, right now, software still the place. Apps are boring. Uh, there's too many apps. That, forgive me, folks. There's just so many apps out there. There's go to the Apple Store. 20,000 apps? It's too many. Yeah. How many do we have on our phones? 20, yeah. 30? Yeah. How often tops? do you use them? No. You got your, your 15 that you, that are there yeah. forever, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, your yeah. Uber, et cetera, et cetera. The, and, and a new app coming in and staying on your phone and getting retention. Yeah. So are you, you like spaces like chatbots? And I do. I, like, I think the world is going to be moving more and more towards voice. Mm. Okay. We're talking with Siri. We're talking with uh, Alexa and all that. And it's kind of rudimentary, but I think we're very, very close to where it's going to be conversational. And and I see that as kind of the big game changer. Uh, Right now, everything is just a little too much of also. Right. Well, I can do this and we can do this also. Mm. That's nice. I can really pay for that extra feature. Um, There's nothing that I've seen lately that really rocks the world. Everything is kind of ordinary. Uh, and, and that's just from a guy who looks at probably, I don't know, 30 to 100 deals a month. Um, and I'm not even exaggerating on that number. Uh, usually we can tell within about three sentences if we're going to keep going forward or not. So it, for the audience, you got to grab us literally in the first paragraph because uh, we're not going to read the rest of it. Um, what, what, what check size do you normally look at and what should that paragraph say? Well... I tell you right now, I mean, it's all over the freaking board. I mean, we've got a guy right now that I really like his deal, but he wants $10 million on $150 million valuation, and he's out $1 million in sales. The funny thing is, he's probably more of a venture capital play. Mm. He just doesn't want to go there yet. Um, I get it. Our check size is typically 100000 plus. Yeah. Okay, the single biggest check ever written. Actually, there's two of them. <clears throat> $20 million for a movie. Ouch. Okay. Uh, shocked from one guy in our room. Whoa. 
And the other one was $35 million into, what did I say we didn't like, biotech? Yeah. Into a biotech company. Yeah. They're big plays, though. If they if they win, they pay big, you know? You just have to... Oh, yeah, it's a long-term way. Yeah. yeah. And those are the kind of things. I mean, AI, I think, is what the future is going to be. Hmm. Um, there could be some consumer goods. I mean, this month, we've got the new Karma coming in to pitch to us. Tell me that it was going to be fun. Wouldn't you like to at least take your investment for a spin? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I don't want to finish with that question. I have another question, which I think okay. would, be, would be just very you for entrepreneurs because you have so much to share. You are you have all these entrepreneurs who are listening. They're all early stage entrepreneurs. You're giving them advice from an angel perspective and from their dad's perspective in that you've run these companies, you've invested in these companies, you've seen so many companies. You have the benefit of probability in what you say. What's your advice to them on what they should do for their business when raising money and growing a great business? Well, real quick, remember what I said earlier, market share? Mm. Really make sure you got a market. I mean, really make sure you got a market before you come in the room. Management teams can be created. You can fire management, bring new management in. I get that. Deals, you can rewrite your deals. People with the ass, you know, with the money will help dictate the deal to you anyway, and you negotiate. But market share is something you can't negotiate. Okay, you got to really know if there's a market out there. So I would tell you, look hard at the market. Keep your story short. I mean, why is here about the elevator pitch? I like what you said earlier. Keep your deck under 10. People should be able to understand what you're doing in a heartbeat. Yeah. The joke is, if you've got to explain it to me, I've you've lost me. Yeah. We don't invest in money, our money in deals we don't understand. Okay. Sometimes they refer to Kiss. angels. Well, keep it simple. Eh? Keep it really simple. You know, I, after you talk to me, I should be able to repeat that. Mm. Okay. I could give you example after examples, but they're still ongoing, so I don't want to give them a plug. Um, but, you know, keep it simple. Um, I'm going to say the last part that's the tough part. Stop listening to people. Okay. The naysayers, the guys that said this won't happen, just blow them off. I think they're wrong. Um, Let your public speak to you. Yeah. I mean, go find the right people. Find the right market. Your Let your market help you develop, yeah. define your product. Yeah. When, when we were building the, this internet home banking product, I, I, I literally got 15 banks to, to pick it up for free. Okay. It was brand new. Nobody had seen this before. And as we worked our way through it, they would give me inputs. The IT guys would call me up. The president of the bank would say, I'd like to have it do this. And so they actually built my product. We didn't build it. I mean, well, we programmed it, right? Made it look pretty with some gooey interfaces. But it was the market that said, do this, do that. This is what we really want. I'd like to see it, you know, do that. I'd like to be able to see my balances in real time. Oh, okay. So um, your market sometimes can actually help build your product if you go and listen to it. Be humble. Be humble but strong. Don't ever, boy, this happens too many times, don't think that you know it at all because if you're standing in front of me, it means you don't know it all, <laughs> okay? That's why you're standing in front of me. You need my cash to get to wherever your dream's going to take you. Uh, that old phrase about don't let people steal your dreams, I mean, there's a lot of people say it's not going to work and this isn't going to happen and don't do it. You know what? Oh, God, you know what? I can't comprehend life without doing it. Mm. I mean, it's just, you know, you talk to like you get up in the morning and everything's been taken, but you're already thinking an hour, two hours, three hours ahead. We got to do this. We've got to do that. Um, write it down so you don't forget. But I absolutely agree with you. It's what makes entrepreneurs very special people. Okay. We are. My wife yeah. says that. I, I think she yeah. says it in a good way. Actually, I hope so. you know what? I could be wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> that because be she's cons- beating me with a stick as she's saying it. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's. Not and consume a, good a lot of pizza. <laughs> 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 right? I think it was what Bill Gates and Paul Allen that locked themselves away in a hotel for a week and lived on pizza and cokes, and uh, to write their first DOS-based product. I mean, it's what we got to do. We're building something the world has never seen before. It's yeah. from us and within us. Doug, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank oh, you for all you do for entrepreneurs everywhere. I'm really grateful for having you as a new friend over here. And we're going to do a bunch together. For anybody contacting you, what's the best way? Well, just go to our website, Archangels Investors. It's all pearl, archangelsinvestors.com. You'll see my picture in there in my bio. 
And uh, somebody wrote that, by the way. I'm always embarrassed by my own bio. I know, right. Uh, but and just hit contact us, and it actually does show up at my desk. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Again, thank you. Thank you for all we do, and we will continue with all this wonderful angel investing, mentoring, educating, and helping entrepreneurship, you and me, for many years in the future. Thanks for joining us. If you know any other entrepreneur equally ambitious as you, then share this podcast by paying it forward to other entrepreneurs who are building your own army. Now, as always, our website, expertdojo.com, is packed with information to help you grow your business, find investment, and train for victory. We also walk our talk and invest in startups every year in our accelerator here in Silicon Beach. You can always reach out to me at brian at expertdojo.com and I look forward to being back here again at our regular time next Tuesday, 10 a.m. with another of the world's top investors helping you win the war against startup failure.